Occult Confessions is brought to you commercial-free through the generous support of our patrons. Visit occultconfessions.com and click on Donate to help keep the history of the occult on the digital airwaves. In 1857, a full-throated defense of Hermetic philosophy and medieval and Renaissance alchemy came from an unexpected source. Major General Ethan Allen Hitchcock, a veteran of two wars who served as chairman of the War Board during the American Civil War. This sober, philosophical military man also happened to have collected one of the most impressive libraries of alchemical literature of the 19th century. Writing in 1871, American occult pioneer Pascal Beverly Randolph worried over the fate of Hitchcock's library after the general's death the year before. Randolph imagined the volumes being scattered across the continent, but in fact, most of Hitchcock's library remains intact at the University of Missouri-St. Louis to this day. Hitchcock was a deeply respected and important man of his time, but he is not considered by anyone to be a major contributor to occult literature. This, I suspect, is a blend of the respect many held for him and the disrespect they held for subjects like alchemy. It was a curiosity that Hitchcock should have taken up the subject at all. At the time that Hitchcock published his remarks on alchemy, the American occult scene was predominantly focused on mesmerism and communication with the dead, aka spiritualism. The spiritualist movement was in full swing, drawing millions to seance tables and trance lectures in both America and Europe. Renaissance and medieval alchemy had little to contribute to this scene, and the popular scholarly perception of alchemists at the time was that they were at best the progenitors of the science of chemistry and, at worst, deluded fools grasping at an impossible scheme to get rich quick through quasi-magical means. Of course, I'm talking about the transmutation of base metals into gold. In the English-speaking world, two figures spoke up to defend and offer an alternative view of the much-maligned alchemists. The first was English author Marianne Atwood, who worked in tandem with her father Thomas South in the study of Hermeticism, and produced a suggestive inquiry into the Hermetic mystery. South had his daughter's book published without reading it first, and after he read what she'd written, together they decided that she'd revealed too much of the Hermetic mystery, and the pair set about buying up and burning as many copies as they could. Seven years after this strange episode in alchemical history, General Ethan Allen Hitchcock published his Remarks Upon Alchemy and Alchemists. Writing almost a century before Young's psychological interpretation of alchemy, Atwood and Hitchcock argued that the mistake alchemy's 19th century critics made was to read the alchemists' detailed treatises literally. In fact, legitimate alchemical literature was meant to be read as an allegory for the elevation of the soul. Reading their work today gives us a window onto the roots of the occult revival, decades before Blavatsky and Crowley and Mathers would begin to create their detailed treatises, blending hermetic Kabbalistic and Eastern philosophies into a grand spiritual exploration. What did Hitchcock know of the hermetic mystery that his contemporaries failed to grasp? And what was so dangerous about his revelations that Atwood's father insisted that she burn her book? I am Rob C. Thompson, your supreme hierophant. Uh, today I'm joined by uh, just just the Grand Master, but it's all the Grand Master we meet we need here at, at the uh, Alchemical Lab. That's Olivia Literal. Hello. You ready for this guy, this general? I am. It's just the two of us. And just the two of us. Copyright song. <laughs> Everyone can imagine that at home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We, the members of the, of the secret, secret order, order of, of alchemical, alchemical actors, do solemnly commit ourselves to a full and honest telling of the, of the history of the occult, of the occult as far as, as we as know, we it. know it. Now, I got a little surprise for you today, Olivia. We're actually going to plug some patrons. Let's uh, open up those plugs. Plug, plug, plug. We got a couple of fun things to talk about. Uh, we're just getting caught up a little bit. We've had some folks joining the Patreon. Uh, I've got to say, I am encouraging everyone. Uh, summer summer comes, Patreon slows down a bit. Uh, please do consider as little as a dollar a month. You too can enjoy our some of our bonus content. Some definitely get to at least our devils devils. Uh, what is it? Music series. Yeah. Uh, but if you give two or five, uh, you get a little bit more more bonus stuff. Uh, the more you add, so. Let's let's meet some patrons, shall we? Yeah, bring it on. We have LJM. 
uh, you're going to find out later. It's L.J. Matthews. Oh. <laughs> yeah. The suspense. <laughs> the suspense. Steph B., Sylvie K., Maxwell W., and Philippe S. Welcome to all of you. Welcome. L.J. Matthews uh, Art is on Etsy at L.J. Matthews Art. Cool. Uh, and sh- uh, sh- L.J., sh- she, they, uh, do a culty, spooky kind of... Uh, it's also cute sort of stuff. So I, I, I encourage you to check out L.J. Matthews' art. I, I checked it out. I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, I also want to plug TerryJoeFrew.com. Oh. <laughs> so Terry Joe uh, is uh, an art professor who has created a coloring book. Olivia, we talked about this. You were oh, super excited yeah, about yeah, this. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a coloring book combining... Pokemon with the lesser key of Solomon. It's like brilliant. It's genius. (laughs) What an idea. Uh, So you can go to terryjofrew.com, T-E-R-R-I, Joe, J-O-F-R-E-W, and and see what she's got. I got to say again, none of these folks are advertisers or anything. We just plug people who are in our community and who do stuff that we think is cool. So check out LJ Matthews, check out Terry Joe. And if you do if you're doing spooky occult things and you want us to share and you're listening, let us know. We're happy to do that. Yeah. Uh you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to violate our general order here. I'm, I'm also oh, going to mention God. a review we got. Usually we do the reviews at the end, but I also want to encourage folks to review us this summer. I I want to get those reviews up mm-hmm. cuz it, it helps us. Uh you know, we're reaching out to folks now and, and trying to build community and it, and it helps the reviews are one of the only public ways we could show that we have people listening <laughs> yeah and it helps with some um some of the the slightly more unhinged reviews that <laughs> yeah, some... um sometimes linger at the top so yeah it's good to keep them nice and buried so uh jb the archie says uh, they need more sessions of occult confessions and Ooh. likes how low-key we feel I like that. In our conversations. So, likes the vibe. Uh, wow, thank you, JB the Archie. We don't get low key very often. That's, no. I'll take that one. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. It's chill. Makes us sound nice and chill as we're going through our Hitchcock <laughs> alchemy. All right, let's close up those plugs. Plug, plug, plug. Okay, let's get into this. Hitchcock, Ethan Allen Hitchcock, spent more than 50 years in the army and took notes multiple times a day on his activities, earning him the moniker the Pen of the Army. Oh my god, that's a that's a title. You like that? Yeah, would you, would you like to be called the, the Pen of the Alchemical Actors? I don't know if you'd like that. Yeah, no, it just makes me sound like I'm like signing all their contracts or something. I'm not sure what... It- Yes, you're responsible for signing things. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I'm going to say, I'm going to let you off the hook if you thought that he was the famous Revolutionary War hero, Ethan Allen. He is not. He is the man's grandson. Should I know who Ethan Allen is? I'm sorry. Is that a bad statement? <laughs> <laughs> Ethan Allen, he, he was involved in uh, Revolutionary War, like I said, but he was involved in uh, like the forts near on the border with Canada and, and that kind of thing. Oh. Yeah, they named a furniture company after him. Oh, wait, are you being serious? <laughs> yeah, I don't think that company could be named after anyone else. This guy was way famous back okay. in the day. Huh, that's weird. But Hitchcock is his grandson, and so, you know, he's got, I, I guess, you know, different names going through the generations, his last name, but he, the Ethan Allen, they named him after his grandfather. <laughs> Uh, he graduated from West Point, which was common for a lot of the Civil War and um, Mexican-American War folks, where he later became a commandant of the Corps of Cadets. So he ended up, you know, being the guy who yells at you on the field oh, okay. when you join. <laughs> Love that. He fought for Andrew Jackson in Florida against the Seminoles. Not so cool. Uh, but he was in the Army. It's not like he could say no. Right. I wouldn't say no to Andrew Jackson either. <laughs> no. <laughs> Scary guy. Served under Zachary Taylor and then as Inspector General for Winfield Scott in the U.S.-Mexico War, sitting at the right hand of the commander from Veracruz to the capital. He started to write a history of the conflict, but for reasons known only to him, didn't get past the first page. He commanded the Pacific Division for three years and retired from the Army when then-Secretary of War Jefferson Davis, who would go on to be the President of the Confederate States of America, refused to grant him four months' leave to attend to his health. 
It was during his retirement from 1855 until 1862 that Hitchcock devoted himself, at least in part, to the study of alchemy. During the Civil War, Hitchcock volunteered for service again and took a position as military advisor to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton and President Abraham Lincoln, serving as chairman of their war board. The preface to Hitchcock's posthumously published memoir, written by W.A. Crofa, lists all of these accomplishments, but talks of his interest in alchemy only obliquely. Crofa says, He was also a student and writer on recondite philosophy, (laughs) and in the intervals of an active career, gave to the world eight volumes on abstruse and esoteric subjects. (laughs) A lot of euphemisms in there, Olivia. What? This dude, like, he he was in contact with a lot of people, like a lot of yeah, like, he was big, big players. Guy. Yeah, he was he was all the man of his day, right? So he worked for both the president of the Confederacy and the president of the United States. Yeah, he's all over. <laughs> uh, but he didn't work for the Confederacy. He was a he was a Union guy through and through. Hmm. Uh, So, uh, of these abstruse, esoteric, and recondite books, one of them was a detailed research take on alchemy, and that's what we're going to get into now. All right, Olivia, you ready for the full title of Hitchcock's alchemy book? Um, Okay, I'm here, strapped in. Don't hold your breath. Ready for this? Mm -hmm. The full title of Hitchcock's more than 300-page tome is... Remarks upon alchemy and the alchemists, indicating a method of discovering the true nature of hermetic philosophy and showing that the search after the philosopher's stone had not for its object the discovery of an agent for the transmutation of metals, being also an attempt to rescue (gasps) from undeserved opprobrium the reputation of a class of extraordinary thinkers in past age. No one is ever going to be able to do, like, an analysis on that. Like, write it a (laughs) research paper? Like, no one would ever do that just because of the title alone. I love the 19th century. They don't write titles. They write the first paragraph and then just stick it on the cover. (laughs) You're kind of right, though. (laughs) What the hell? That's a lot. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, that's, let me see, five lines. It took me five lines in my document here. Literally on the front cover? Or is the front cover, like, blank, and it's, like, just on the inside? Well, I guess there's probably a bunch of... Traditionally, in the 19th century, you would see the full title, at least on the title page. So you would probably right. see the words Remarks on Alchemy. Those would be nice and big, Remarks on Alchemy and the Alchemist. And then you would see all these other words trailing down the page. Oh, my God. Even cite- just citing that would just be such a pain. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, done, I've done it, so I know. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> yes, yeah. It was published in Boston by Crosby, Nichols & Company in the year 1857. In his preface, Hitchcock sets out his main premise. Man was the subject of alchemy, and that the object of the art was the perfection, or at least the improvement, of man. The writings of the alchemists are all symbolical. Basically, alchemy is a metaphor for humans. When he set out to write, Hitchcock had only intended for this project to be a pamphlet, but he had so many alchemists to cite and so much to say on the subject that it quickly became a book. The the title alone is a pamphlet. (laughs) Like that, how did did he think he was going to get that word count down? (laughs) He was beyond pamphlet length by the time he'd finished the title page. Also, when does he, is he just like writing in between like, like bad like what is when is he writing all this this is in his retirement period so oh, it is between okay. and his retirement is not complete right because he he moves from retiring from the army under uh jefferson davis to re not really re-enlisting but joining the war board under abraham lincoln so oh, I see. he's got like a you know like five years off ten years off mm, okay in his book, Hitchcock demonstrates that he was not only that he had not only collected a vast store of alchemical literature, but he had read it and pondered it. I'm looking at all you out there who buy those books and just put them on your shelf. You say, <laughs> "I'm going to read that later." <laughs> We've all done it. I've done it. I have books that I keep meaning to get to. I hear you. But I got episodes to write, you guys. Among his many citations are the alchemists Sandivogius, Alipi. Uh, oh, sorry, Alapili, which is Arabic, Cornelius Agrippa, Thomas Norton, George Ripley, Isaac Hollandus, Artifius, Basil Valentine, Espagnet, George Ripley, and Giordano Bruno. That's just a short list of the people he cites. 
He indicates in the book that he had produced a brief paper on the subject which had excited some controversy and elicited criticism from scholars who believed alchemy was never much more than a big ol' waste of time. This, says Hitchcock, misses the symbolism, which he points out is a hallmark of great literature through the ages, including the sacred scriptures, in quotes there, but you know what he means. And misses the dangerous inquisitorial context in which these writers were exploring their hermetic philosophy. So there's a few things going on here. I mean, first of all, why are we talking about Hitchcock in our fiction series? It's because he's saying that alchemy, he's not saying it's fiction, but he's saying it's allegory, that we shouldn't read it literally. Also, my man is saying, mid-19th century, that we shouldn't read the Bible literally. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I wasn't going to say it and connect it, but I was thinking it. Right? 1857. Go for it, Hitchcock. The alchemists were reformers in their time, obliged indeed to work in secret, but nevertheless making their impression upon the public. They lived, for the most part, in an age when an open expression of their opinions would have brought them into conflict with the superstition of the time, and thus exposed them to the stake. There was no doubt an abundance of impostors who played upon the credulity and cupidity of the public, but the genuine alchemists were religious men, who passed their time in legitimate pursuits, earning an honest subsistence, and in religious contemplation, studying how to realize in themselves the union of the divine and human nature, expressed in man by an enlightened submission to God's will. He says they're reformers, basically, they're political reformers. Who? The alchemists. Oh, okay. Yeah, that alchemy is about political and cultural reform. Oh, that's kind of interesting. So he says that the alchemists had to write in symbolic or allegorical form for two reasons. First, to shield themselves from attack by the religious authorities. Oh. And, right, because, you know, they're exploring the soul, right? They might Mm. be saying things that aren't in line with the dogma of the church. Second, for fear that their work would be misunderstood and mislead their contemporaries who had only ever been schooled in, and I'm quoting here, religious tenets according to tradition and could not understand the finer points of hermetic thought, just like I can't understand the finer points of the movie Tenet. Never seen her. Don't know her. (laughs) That's all right. That's all right. You're not missing anything. Uh, I, I might be getting hate mail if I go into this too much. So <laughs> getting getting back to religious tenets and not the movie tenet. I mean, his, his argument there is that he uses allegory, or, or rather that the alchemists used allegory because their thought processes were so complex that they wanted to have a reader who was able to read through the allegory, you know, who, who understood the subject well enough. So they didn't want to just put it right out there because a literal attempt to talk about the secrets of alchemy, which are really the secrets of the soul, would it would be ineffective. You know what I mean? Like we can't yeah. speak about the soul in literal terms. So it'd be misleading. The knowledge of God lies in man and not in the nature of any other thing in the universe. Just us. Only we can have the knowledge of God. Mm, this is a 19th century way of thinking. Okay. And so, the proper subject for alchemy is the study of man as microcosm. This should start to sound familiar. A little bit of as above, so below. The man, man is microcosm of the universe. If we study ourselves, we will understand the universe. Mm-hmm. Different philosophers use different words to refer to the human as subject, but the human is most often discussed as a metal or mineral. For example, antimony, lead, zinc. Arsenic, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars. All of these are, I I guess, metaphorical terms for us, for the human. The best man, says Hitchcock, by nature, being likened to gold, and inferior men to the inferior metals. So what what he means there is the transmutation of inferior metals, base metals, into gold is the transmutation of an inferior human into a best human. Uh, Okay. Hmm. You got me? So when all these alchemists are talking about how they can do this with a base metal, they're really talking about how you can do it with your soul. You can transmute your soul. That's interesting. Yeah, it's a cool idea. I think it's become more common among folks who study alchemy today, but, you know, 1857. This is, you know, sometimes we do the big stuff. We do Aleister Crowley and we do, 
Yates and whatever, but sometimes we do the deeper cuts. This man is a deeper cut. This is somebody you're learning about for the first time today, and that's okay. That's good, though. That's what we're here for. We like to do the big stuff. We also like to do the deeper cuts. Mm -hmm. The philosopher's mercury, which is the central ingredient for most alchemical elixirs, is a perfectly pure conscience, or a conscience purified under a sense of the presence of God. Mm, Okay. It is called an incombustible sulfur, because in whomsoever the conscience is properly awakened, a fire is raised, which burns and consumes everything opposed to its own nature. So, my man is super moral. Like, morality is what it's all about. Uh, And you have to be free of guilt, is basically what he's saying. The pure conscience, conscience, like the philosopher's mercury, is not an end in itself, although the end can be found in it. (laughs) What he means there is that a pure conscience, you know, being guilt-free, is the starting point or base to discover the philosopher's stone which is how we turn ourselves from base metals into golden people. Mm -hmm. And this process receives a whole lot of attention in Hitchcock's book. Hitchcock argues that questions of religion, meaning which religious beliefs are valid, are answered by the conscience, which dictates that, and I'm quoting him here, the highest of all religious duties is that of obedience to God. A sense of duty made cheerful by love is the true ground of that perfect obedience to God. So it's giving yourself to God and loving God, loving yourself, loving that whole, you know, sort of flowing with God's energy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is this dude married? He gets married right before he dies. <laughs> I was wondering if, like, this dude's married and, ha- and had kids, or was married and had kids, or what? I'm pretty sure no children. Yeah, he, I think he only got married once right before he died. Yeah. yeah. Why? What would that change? No, I guess I was just wondering, like, if he also, like, imparted any of this on his family, I guess, or just, like, <laughs> no, not imparted ch- is a bad word, but, like had if this was like a shared family knowledge like if he was like preaching not preaching this do you know what i'm saying is you're imagining like, being raised by ethan allen hitchcock yeah kind of <laughs> or like even it's like if he had a wife i was just thinking like is she like is she just is she in this is she being a good christian woman what's up what's going on but i you guess know, you just answered I- me Oddly enough, I was kind of doing this last night. My kid woke us up at two o'clock in the morning, which she doesn't do anymore. She's three years old. She knows better than that. And I basically told her that <laughs> by four, because she wouldn't go to sleep. By 4 a.m., she's still like playing around in the crib. And, you know, I said, you got to feel bad, man. Like, this is not good for me. It's not good for mommy, who's pregnant. It's not good for you. You need to start feeling badly about doing things like this. So I... <laughs> I said to Katie, we don't want to raise a psychopath. We have to instill a sense of responsibility to others, right? That's essentially what Hitchcock's talking about here. We have to have a pure pure conscience. We need to be free of guilt. But to do that, we need to flow with whatever God has planned for us. It's not not very Satanist, is it? The Satanist is very self-directed. It honestly sounds a little bit like, I don't know. I I would think like there are a lot of Christians today that would think kind of similarly i suppose but remember hitchcock is very allegorical about the bible so flowing with god is right in part you know you don't know what god wants Mm-hmm. so i guess i'm thinking like newer young christianity like maybe not so much yeah. does it make sense i don't know yeah i guess no not. i think that's all right it's a, yeah it's possibly it, it's definitely not i guess i'm saying satanist but we have people write in that there's like these different schools of satanism it's not very crowley mm-hmm. well the know, idea the, of like ha- uh, i don't know even what you're saying like feeling responsible like with other people and i don't know responsibility is key but do what thou wilt not so much as do what god wilt have you do yeah so you yeah it's I mean? not really satanist no. either it's not, you know, it's very, not very existentialist, right? We're trying to, you know, connect with this higher power and flow with that higher power. It's mm-hmm. giving oneself over to God. Mm-hmm. Hitchcock is not writing a strictly Christian book, despite all these things we're saying here. Mm-hmm. While he is hostile to the concept of a Muslim struggle against non-believers, he's not great about that. He says, that's that's not really cool. We, people shouldn't be fighting over religion. 
He also defends... Yeah, it's a fair point. He defends Muslim alchemists and draws on Vedic and Hindu philosophy to defend his points. Okay. I I do want to say here jihad can be interpreted as an effort to convert people rather than kill them. Mm. But that's a modern point that I'm making. That's not a point Hitchcock makes. Religious belief as the true reflection of conscience is not dogmatic. Barely concealed in this is the notion of a pure religion of conscience underneath most, if not all, religious creeds, which is a kind of universal belief that future American occultists, including Helena Blavatsky and Emma Harding Britton's Chevalier, will champion. Let your conscience be your guide. Don't worry about all these complex rules. So he's kind of us in that way. Right on. Yeah. Arguing against a critic in the Westminster Review, Hitchcock takes issue with the supremacist notion that Islamic or Arabian alchemy was inferior to Christian alchemy because it focused solely on the creation of gold, whereas Christians introduced the idea the soul might be purified as a necessary condition to accomplishing physical transmutation. So in other words, these people were saying, oh, those Arabians, they were just, they were just about gold, the Islamic folks. The Christians were more open-minded. He's saying, no, no, that's wrong. Oh, okay, good. He says the Arabians are okay, oh, and here's okay. why. Yeah, good. He plucks a text by Geber the Arabian from his vast library, and in that text he quotes Geber who says, The artist should be intent on the true end only, because our art is reserved in the divine will of God and is given to or withheld from whom he will who is glorious, meaning God is glorious, sublime, and full of justice and goodness. So that Geber quote is saying essentially what Hitchcock has already, you know, we've been talking about, that fine, transmuting gold, metal into gold, but you need to be in accordance with the will of God to accomplish this. So that suggests there's a deeper spiritual thing going on in the Islamic alchemy as well. The alchemist's soul must be right with God before accomplishing anything. And this is Islamic. So Hitchcock's defending Islam against these critics. Without using the word, Hitchcock speaks about the dissolution of ego as the first step in which the alchemist is summoned into the presence of God and feels the smallness of his pursuits and the impossibility of evasion from the divine presence. I'll be honest, this is how I prefer to view my personal religious path. It's a kind of shrinking in the face of a great mystery. Uh, but again, not so Crowleyite, doing what thou will. <laughs> background here. I think it's more Blavatsky, though. Blavatsky views us as cogs in this very large and complex universe. The alchemist's passions, hopes, and fears are neutralized so that the conscience can act freely and according to its own essential heavenly nature. So we try to get into God's presence and sort of like burn off all of our ego so that we can just flow in the right path. The alchemist's will gives way to a kind of divine God consciousness, which then directs his activities after you've been burned clean. Hitchcock describes the alchemist's way to achieve their goal as an unreasoning, though not unreasonable, obedience to an experienced, imperious sense of duty leaving the result to God. You really are letting go and letting God here. What he means by unreasoning is that you're not trying to think against your impulse, but it's not unreasonable because it makes sense to do this. You know, there's logic behind this, which we're sort of unpacking here. The alchemist's end, he says, is the fruit of obedience. The man, by a steady preservation of the inward unity, being prepared alike for all outward events, may finally be the subject of some special experience. A peculiar knowledge of the unity of God, with a sense of participation in it. If a man can enter into the life of truth and love, he really enters into the life of God, and must feel conversely that the life of God has entered into him. 
Although Hitchcock makes no reference to trance states or mesmerism here, he was an admirer of the Swedish trance writer Emanuel Swedenborg. In essence, the idea of giving oneself over to God to become God's instrument is a hallmark of occult practice, from voodoo and santeria to Aleister Crowley's Book of the Law. While in no way identifying as a proper occultist, Ethan Allen Hitchcock is most definitely speaking like one. This brings us to Hitchcock's somewhat esoteric metaphysical musings on love. The alchemists, he says, achieve this transformation of self through an act of love, which works the greatest of wonders, namely that of a transformation of the subject of it into the object loved. Subject becomes object, and object becomes subject. We become what we love, is what he's saying. It's it's deep. (laughs) Yeah. Hitchcock speaks variously on the alchemist's love. He compares it to platonic love, which he says is a vulgar version of the love of truth. So even like, even our platonic love, Olivia, for each other is, we need to love truth more than, more than that. He didn't have to call it vulgar. Right? That's not right. It's a little much. (laughs) (laughs) Student must not have had a lot of friends then. (laughs) <laughs> People liked him, but yeah. he was a, he was hardcore because of all this morality stuff. Yeah. So people mostly relied on him, I think, as, as you know, like if you needed someone to vouch for you, like if you if you were accused of murdering yeah. someone, this is your alibi. Yeah, that's true. So through loving truth, the alchemist undergoes a transformation such as the alchem- such that the alchemist becomes a living embodiment of truth. So he's equating truth and God here. We want to love truth. And by loving truth, we love God. God is truth. Love of truth is love of God. It's like kind of Gnostic-y, sort of. Like the idea of like knowledge equaling like the spark of light of God and all that jazz. Yeah, it's got some theosophy in there too, for sure. That, you know, the serpent of wisdom is a good thing. Mm. Hmm. You know, serpent of truth. Although he's not, he's not going to bring up Lucifer or any of that here. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. You don't want to stir that pot. Uh, love is associated with three colors in alchemy, all focused on achieving the mysterious transformations of trinity into unity. The three colors are a trinity, but they are also a unity. They are one in the same. So this is, the, I guess, the mystery of the trinity. Three colors are one color, one color is three. In its white state, Luna, the white state of the stone, alchemical love is affection. In its red state, Soul, it is the intellectual conviction of the unity of all things. In its black state, this love is humility or philosophical contrition in the face of this great truth and understanding. So each color is an orientation to truth equals God. You got me? Yeah. White, red, and black can also be equated to the trinity of body, soul, and spirit, or the trinity of God as, number one, self-existence, number two, active cause, and number three, passive effect. So this is a, like a monad kind of system, too, a little bit like Blavatsky as well, that all things are made of one. Everything is God. God is God. God is also the cause of all things, and God is the effect of all things. God is yin and yang, active cause, passive effect. This is all me interpreting Hitchcock. He would not be using any of these terms. Meditating on the fundamental unity of any of these trinities, a kind of Hindu or Buddhist exercise, is one means of alchemical transformation. So you can just sit and meditate on the the trinity. And it's not just me projecting the Indian comparison onto Hitchcock's ideas in this context, Hitchcock himself references the Bhagavad Gita, which was first translated into English in 1785 for its use of the concept that there is a fundamental unity between action and inaction. So he may not be thinking in Taoist terms, which I was just referencing with yin and yang, but he is kind of thinking in Hindu terms. So he's sort of beating Blavatsky to the punch here. This, says Hitchcock, is the same unity of Luna and Soul, Sun and Moon, Masculine and Feminine. I mean, there's so much Taoism here, but he's not thinking that way. He's thinking in terms of Hinduism. Mm -hmm. Hitchcock, you know, to sort of sum up, uh, you know, our ideas on Hitchcock here, he's going up against a strong materialist prejudice against his spiritual interpretation of the alchemist's work. A lot of people just want to view them as proto-chemists. They're scientists who just were misled or misguided. 
And as the latter half of our conversation so far has demonstrated, he explores some complex metaphysical notions in the process. For the most part, Hitchcock set out these mysteries without delving too far into the particulars, but he did lay the groundwork for a variety of spiritual practices very different from the standard Protestant worship dominant in America at the time period. A secret, meditative, complex spirituality existed beyond the limits of standard church worship. The degree to which this challenged conventional notions of religion, particularly in medieval and Renaissance Europe, meant that these ideas could only be recorded in veiled language. Thoughts on Hitchcock, Olivia? I like him. (laughs) He he passes. Passes muster. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I feel like... I was going to say there's a lot of people I don't like on this show, but that's not true. (laughs) There's more people I like than I don't like. I don't know. He sounds like a chill dude. Well, maybe chill is not the right word. (laughs) Not chill, no. (laughs) But you're down with his philosophy, I mean. I would have dinner with him. Not platonic, evidently. Or (laughs) romantic. It was just a dinner, but... A dinner of truth with a capital T. Yeah, I'd like to hear what he would have to say in a conversation. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, fascinating guy. I mean, just across the board, a fascinating guy, a fascinating life. But then this this interesting chapter slash library. I mean, P.P. P. Randolph was really concerned with what would happen to this guy's library, that he, he was so versed in alchemy. I don't know that Blavatsky read Hitchcock or any of that, but mm. I think it's hard to say that his work didn't have some impact on the occultism to follow and, and didn't inspire some of the you know later interpreters of alchemy who saw it as allegory, which is how we tend to read it now. Yeah, I was about to say, even just the idea of like allegory and how he was viewing it. Yeah, like like we mentioned earlier, like even with the Bible, like an allegory. I don't know. It's interesting. It's forward thinking, forward thinking character. Mm-hmm. I hereby adjourn and declare close this meeting in the secret order of alchemical actors till such time as we get together and do it again. I want to thank Brandon Walls for doing the voice of Ethan Allen Hitchcock for us today. My name is Rob C. Thompson, joined here by Olivia Literal. That's What's that? Is that, me. What? Is that, is that the... I think our alchemical actor uh, f- phone is ringing. Oh. The alchemical phone. Do you hear that? Olivia, could you check that out? Uh, Yeah, it's... You're, you're calling us. That's the... That's what the L chemical caller ID says. Oh no, that's that's not me actually. That's a that's alternate universe me. I'm sorry. Yeah, same number, but from a different universe. Uh, should should we answer that? Uh, yeah, probably. Let let let's see what he wants. Rob. Rob. Hey, listen. I think you all need to uh, lighten the mood a little on occult confessions. Here on Confessing Occultists, we've been doing a whole series on the Crab Shell Saga. Did you post something on that last month? It was April Fool's. It was it was a joke. Besides, that, that wasn't us. It was Church Secrets. Or was it? It was. Or was it? Have you ever gone to listen to a podcast and thought to yourself, I wish I was listening to a different podcast with some of these same people doing different things? Sometimes there's an episode on the Occult Confessions feed that isn't an episode of Occult Confessions. Is it history? Is it the occult? Is it satire or Dadaist nonsense or perhaps some sort of auditory hallucination? That, dear listeners, is up to you. Curiously Strange is a presentation of State Radio AM. My name is Aaron Arbelson. Today's story begins, as most of our stories do, with a curious message from a curious source in a decidedly curious little town on the Maryland side of the Chesapeake Bay. Miss Gina Irene Gogol wrote to tell us that her garden gnomes had been stolen. It was, in all likelihood, a prank perpetrated by a crew of mischievous but otherwise harmless pubescents, a case for the neighborhood watch, or maybe the local constable. This was, at first glance, a story that hardly rose to the standard of curious or strange, except for the fact that Miss Gogol's yard contained over 100 unique gnome-style statues, carefully arranged in various tableau from her porch to sidewalk, an enormous job for anyone to haul off. At least, that's what Miss Gogol described in her letter to us and repeated on several phone calls with me and my producer. Because, you see, 
When we finally decided to make the trek down from our New York offices to Ms. Gogol's estuary adjacent lot, we discovered no gnomes whatsoever. I suppose that isn't so strange, since she'd written to us that they'd all been stolen. But it appeared that Miss Gogol's house had also been stolen. Presumably with Gogol inside. Because the address was vacant, and seemed to have been vacant for quite some time, the only feature, aside from the crabgrass and weeds filling the empty lot, was a single, untrimmed yew bush. And as if this wasn't unusual enough, the lone botanical specimen had, for some reasons we could only begin to fathom, been spray-painted blue. A blue yew. It may have been a signal, or an art installation, or a metaphor of some kind for which we lacked the context to perform any meaningful analysis, these circumstances were, beyond a doubt, both curious and strange. Hey, y'all looking to buy? Zoned for residential and commercial. Been mostly using it on the commercial side lately, but I'm willing to part with it if the deal is fair. That's Nick Pagliani. He owns the house next door. He has a peculiar way of speaking like he's inventing the language as he goes as it turns out the gnomes were his gnomes pinwheels spin bugs horkheimers wind socks sock men wind men wind sock men japanabilia and the jockeys of course didn't make much at it but it was a decent side hustle even post some had a halfway decent interpretation of dolly's temptation of saint anthony that we did with yard reflectors and a ceramic sheep Ella hung some of them silver cords from a miniature lighthouse and painted the bush. It's sort of her creative interpretation, I suppose, insofar as that there isn't much in the way of foliage in Dolly. Ella's my oldest. Moved out six months ago, but she still comes by to feed the monitor lizards and help with the business from time to time. People would stop and say, isn't that sweet, when they saw our installations and they'd buy the whole scene. That didn't happen often, but we did it as much for ourselves as anyone. There's no predicting the behavior of the average American roadside consumer. Marketing is like trying to read the terms of your mortgage after they've been stuffed up inside a donkey's anus. What happened to your lawn ornaments? They got gashed up. Gashed bad. Every single one of them. I'll never forget the looks on their dumb, rosy little faces with that unholy marker carved on their foreheads like a bunch of tiny Charles Mansons. I couldn't stand to look at the flamingos recreating the pieta in the back corner. We're thinking of farming ants now. You ever ate ant honey? Gotta come up with a name for it. Ant do dirt nectar, do dirt. Gashed how? On the gnomes? It was a kind of sign, over and over. Like a circle, but with angles. Like a rectagon. Now, I'm not being thick. I know what a rectangle is, and that's not what I mean. It was a shape with ears, like bunny ears, but long and thin and pointy. Man came by that afternoon and bought the whole bunch. Lucky chance. He wouldn't take them full price, but me and mother still got ours. Scruffy guy. Kind of nervous looking. Loaded them up in his pickup and peeled out of here like a bat out of Bombay. Oh, we didn't get his name. Man from the paper asked the same question. You had a reporter here? Oh, yeah, we got a write-up. Mother framed it. Where flamingos fear to tread. Do you mind if I have a look? Help yourself. It's a risky enterprise, lawn ornament sales with what your merchandise exposed at all hours of the night and day to every pervert with a pen and knife bold enough to violate the sacred bonds of retail. Nick had never heard of Gina, Irene Gogol. We tried her number several times, but received no answer, and her voice mailbox was full. We decided to follow up with the reporter who had covered Nick's story. My name is Jamie Markhart, and I am a feature writer and politics correspondent for the Cape Crier. That flamingo story was a funny thing. Not funny like strange, though it was strange. The event was ridiculous, but just creepy enough to get a mention in the bottom corner of the front page. See page 3. The thing is, the Pollyanni house wasn't the only residence that was vandalized that night. There were about 50 other houses in the area that had their bird baths and garden art or whatever carved up. If it was a prank, it required real dedication and probably at least two people to execute. Most of the residents I interviewed still had their yard thing. I took some pictures that didn't make it into print if you want to see them. Editor thought it might push the devil angle too far. See this picture? That carving had to take some time, and they did it a hundred times in the Pollyanna yard and then fifty more times across the neighborhood. 
you have to admire their commitment. You mentioned on the phone that you'd spoken with Gina Irene Gogol. Yeah, she called me, but she didn't say anything about the yard stuff. She said the blue bush crows at dawn. It wasn't that, but it was stupid like that, you know? Something about the blue bush. But it was kind of threatening, like she was trying to intimidate me. She said the crabs are watching. I don't know what she meant by that either. I mean, it's Maryland. There's crabs everywhere. Well, not everywhere, but in the bay and stuck up on the bumper of everyone's SUV like they're the only ones with a Maryland plate who thinks crabs are cool. They make this crab-shaped bread at the bakery around the corner. Comes with a dip. You should try it. Listen, I'm going to write down an address for you. You should go see this guy. Don't tell him I sent you. I don't have his name. I don't think he ever gave it to me. He's got an above-ground pool. Ask to take a look under the solar cover. That's all I'm going to say about it. The address Jamie gave us was the only house on a dead-end street, but was by no means remote. It was around the corner from a motorcycle bar, and a block down from the neighborhood's two convenience stores, which stood facing each other across a crowded intersection. The pool was only slightly wider than a hot tub, and easily visible from the road with a bright solar cover, like bubble wrap stretching across the top and down the sides. The pink of the aluminum and neon green of the cover made the pool appear a bit like a giant can of Mountain Dew. We were tempted to just walk up to the cover and take a peek inside, but a generic-looking pickup in the driveway and a slight flutter of the curtains in the large front window let us know we were being watched. The man who came to the door was more or less exactly who we expected to see. He wore a t-shirt that said, Deep State Diver, in chains on his wrist and neck that turned out to be made of copper. We were anxious to have a look in his pool and not sure how to ask, but he got ahead of us. All we had to do was mention the reporter's name. Jamie Marcotte sent us. Uh, you gotta have a look inside my pool. Don't worry, it's safe. I took a class down at uh, the, the fire station on CPR. Go ahead and start up that mic, brother. Uh, you know, I, I have a podcast myself. Are you federally funded? Don't answer that. I don't need to know. You're doing a story on the lawn jockeys, right? I've been following that story since March. You're a brave man, persons. Uh, I can't say for sure who's behind it, but, but, but I'll tell you one thing. They aren't timid. I'll give, I'll give you a sense of how deep this thing goes. There were a couple of uh, German guys. Well, more or less lost history named Green. Uh, they, they gathered up two books of legends, tales of the old country, stories about, about dragons and nudist murder trolls and giant killers named Gunther. Well, well, well they had this story about two sisters, one rich and married and uh, one poor and a widow. Uh, and the rich sister wouldn't give the poor sister any money to feed her kids. So the father, the, the one who was alive, he starts to slice up his loaf of bread in the kitchen and, uh, and get this, the bread bleeds human blood. Right at that moment... The widow's kids ne- ke- just keeled over dead, like, like slicing the bread killed them. Because the bread isn't bread. It's sex magic. That's what we're witnessing here, is the resurgence of a mythic tradition going all the way back to pagan Europe. Here, let me just peel that back. Take a good long look. There they were. A hundred gnomes and jockeys, trolls and flamingos, piled nearly to the top of the pool each with the same curiously strange symbol carved into its forehead. What secret horrors hide in the dark places scattered throughout this great country of ours? This man, who would only tell us his initials, C, S, had exorcised these creatures in holy water from the Chester River. The Chester River was a local tributary to the bay where the founder of his church, a church he never named, had been baptized. I've neutralized their formation. It wouldn't be easy for them to replicate this stunt. You can't just go around carving anything you like whenever you feel like it, even if you can get away with it. These symbols take power, and power comes from a finite supply. The Cabal was trying to turn this town into one of their coven stations, repurposing these innocent statuaries into heathen idols. It's all part of an elaborate ritual. You know Greek mythology? The pizza girl was going to copulate with a bull, breed the beast. I don't mean literally, of course. She'd probably just get some bovine semen from the dairy farm on Route 50 and use it use a, like a, like a tur- turkey baster. 
Uh, yeah, but, 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 but as long as I got these babies underwater, her boyfriend won't be able to get an erection. The narrative had turned in a direction that was unlikely to pass the censors at State Radio AM, and so we decided to pack it up and head to lunch. So you are federally funded. Page 91 of the program for Baydale High's 2015 fall musical, Little Shop of Horrors. The ancient panto troops spoke in code, but they knew the truth. That's the drama club, you understand? No. We really appreciate you showing us around your pool. We should try that bakery with the dip. I'm pretty sure we passed it on the way into town. God's food. That's the name of the story. Is it really a grim tale? Looks like it. Here's a photo from that page from the program. The band teacher had them all in a box in her office. Page 91 is some sort of, like, parent advertisement. Congratulations, Jake. You're the mean green mother of our hearts. What does that mean? It's a song. From the show, Little Shop of Horrors, you know, the one where the plant eats the people. Should I narrate lunch? Might as well. It wasn't so much a bakery as it was a roadside coffee truck that baked. There was a bespoke unicorn on the hood of the vehicle and a motley correction of unkempt plastic lawn furniture under an awning that looked as though it had only just barely survived a tropical depression. My producer noticed the third specimen in a row of arborvitaes lining the back of the parking lot had been painted the same shade of blue as the U at the Palayani homestead. The bread was also peculiar. Not in texture or taste, but in shape. It was unnerving, but in a comforting sort of way, like the bread was trying to tell us something that the bread itself didn't understand. As if the bakers had taken some horrible childhood trauma and cooked it into something wholesome. Ella made a whole case of them last month. Mr. Franks was going to fire her, but then the customers started buying them. And they sold out before lunch. Mr. Franks thought they looked like crabs, so that's why he came up with a dip to go with it. I don't see it. Yeah, me neither. But those thin bits look like arms. I mean, definitely not claws. I thought maybe they might be ears, but they're so thin, I I started seeing them as horns. Do you know anything about the bush? I wax. Aaron, the phone! You have it. It's Gina. Pick it up. We hadn't heard from Gina in over a week. Despite repeated attempts to reach her since we'd arrived in town that morning, she refused to answer our calls. And now, here she was. Did you just pick up the phone and start narrating? Context is important. You don't sound like Gina. (laughs) So you really bought that old woman voice. That's funny. I do do other voices, but I I just didn't realize that I was that good. Maybe the bitty should have been French. We didn't know what you were supposed to sound like in the first place. You could have sounded like anything at all. And we would have accepted it. Well, that's on you. I heard that you visited that guy with the pool. So you think that this is some kind of quirky human interest story. That's cute. I mean, honestly, whatever helps you sleep at night. I know you're only trying to figure out the plot to find, like, an angle on it. You know, you're not interested in the details. It's all coincidence. Your listeners don't want to get too deep into this. It's just mind candy. Am I right? Honestly, I don't I don't care if you think I'm right. Allow me to enlighten you with a little sneak peek behind the dressing room door. You aren't covering the plan. You are the plan. Make them feel like it's all wrapped up. Keep them dumb while they keep giving them the feeling like they've heard something smart. A complete story. The sweet, stupid anesthetic of closure. Do me a favor. When you meet the Minotaur, let her know that Ella sent you. It was a curious call. We hung out an extra day, but no more gnomes were vandalized, and nobody calling themselves the Minotaur ever reached out to us, so we packed up our equipment and headed home. Maybe Gina was right. Maybe we were too focused on the eccentricity of this strange occurrence and not enough on the mystery at the heart of it. Maybe 
and driving out to cover this sordid affair of the drowned lawn ornaments, we had only served to add ourselves, and by extension, all of our listeners, to the perplexed pool of homeowners sadly regarding their gnarled gnomes. Maybe we had been pawns, victims of the crabs, mocking us from the bumpers of the SUVs and hybrid sedans busily crisscrossing the sunlit byways of suburban mm-hmm. Maryland, from dance classes mm-hmm. to Boy Scout meetings to the pediatrician and home again. Maybe the Minotaur would find us when we least expected it, and when it did, things wouldn't go so well for us. This, in my estimation, was more or less exactly what we deserved. You have been listening to Curiously Strange, a self-aware presentation of State Media AM. Deep Sunrise Wellness Experience is presented by the Five-Sided Podcast Network in cooperation with Breadcrumb Media. I am your host, Chakra Lila. Today's Wellness Minute is about healing toxic relationships. Have you ever asked a friend for help only to be rejected? Have you ever gone to someone you thought you knew and loved you and would do anything for you and inquired if you might milk them of their bodily fluids as part of an initiation rite into a secret cabal and heard, No, you're crazy. That's the craziest thing anyone ever asked me. What do you even mean by milk me? Is this like a sex thing or is there blood involved? I don't think we have that kind of relationship. What are you into anyway? I'm worried about you. I'm going to go get a frappuccino because I'm kind of crashing right now, and then we'll talk about this. I think you might need some kind of intervention. How did that make you feel? Our guest guru this morning is Mackenzie H. of the Get It Girl podcast, and she's here to talk about a a toxic relationship that she healed. Wow, Chakra. Um, Thank you so much for that introduction means a lot. Um, See, I actually was the toxic friend in this scenario. And I needed to heal myself before I could heal the relationship. But in order to heal myself, I needed to receive healing from the girl who was sleeping with the guy that I was kind of seeing on the side. Uh, Our mutual friend, Abriella. I'm sure you've uh, spoken about her on your podcast. Yes, yes. Um, And I have said some horrible things, unforgivable things, things that were so bad that they not only triggered her, but boomeranged back and like reverse triggered me, which initiated another trigger, which she then triggered back at Red Boxer Briefs, who triggered me. And it was kind of sexy, like like a triggered three-way. But you know, at the same time, totally, totally toxic. And how did you resolve this vicious circle of unwellness? Well, you know, it might sound strange, but um, I actually let her milk me. As it turns out, um, she was super into this, like, indie underground scene. And, I mean, if I'm being honest with myself, which I'm constantly pretending that I am, you know, I was getting a little too basic, even for some of my spray tanned fans. So this was really like the perfect solution for my brand. I got this tattoo on my neck, which is totally not my style, but really complements like the whole revised image, you know? I even respelled the name of my show so it only uses actual words from the English language, like standardized numbers of letters, you know, R and L. Listen, I know it sounds weird. I know. But trust me on this one. Milk your friends or get milked by them. I really, I really believe you will thank me later. Well, uh, thank you, Mackenzie, for joining us on the Deep Sunrise Wellness Experience. We strive to be worthy of your wisdom. Thank you, Chakra. I really appreciate you having me on today. And just remember, get
it girl